Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeu. And on this edition of the show, we're going to be discussing the latest with regards to William Saliba's fitness. Will he make the trip to Anfield or will he be left out? Is he still unavailable for the Gunners. I know a lot of Arsenal fans out there are sweating about the Frenchman's availability. We'll also bring you the latest with regards to the contract talks between the Frenchman and the club. Those talks are still ongoing. Uh, We'll be talking about who's been appointed as the referee at Anfield. We'll also be discussing the Rafael Leal rumours. We'll be discussing Harry Kane's antics from last night and we'll be rounding up uh, the rest of the transfer talk as, of course, the summer uh, edges just a little bit closer. I know our minds are on the title race and not the summer at this point, but that hasn't stopped the tabloids and various other outlets uh, jumping on the transfer bandwagon at this point in the season. I hope you're all good. I hope you're all well. Uh, It is a pre-recorded edition today, so this is not a live show uh, for the benefit of those uh, watching or listening to this back a little bit later on. Um, A pre-record, I did promise you that we'd keep the release time Um, and the level of content uh, in terms of how regularly we produce it consistent. But that does mean from time to time there will be days where we pre-record our episodes uh, as opposed to jumping on the live stream over on our YouTube channel. But if you are interested in those live streams, uh, then make sure you are subscribed to the Chronicles of Aguna YouTube channel uh, as we continue our journey towards 30,000 subscribers over there. If you're listening on the audio, uh, we love you equally uh, as well. So uh, keep tuning in that way. Uh, Make sure you leave us a review if you haven't done so already let's get into it then Uh, William Saliba expected to miss Arsenal's trip to Anfield at the weekend a huge huge game for the Gunners we keep talking about the importance of every single game every single week and you know I'm starting to grow a little bit frustrated with some of the kind of pushback I get from friends and colleagues who maybe aren't Arsenal supporters uh, when they're talking about the title race because one of the things I often hear is well it's yours to throw away Well, Arsenal are nailed on now. Arsenal have got to go on and finish the job. And actually, the reality, as we pointed out on yesterday's episode, is that all Arsenal need to do is draw one game. And if Manchester City can go on and win all of their games, including the one against us, it's it's theirs. You know, we're only one draw away from giving up control of this title race to Manchester City. So we're not far and away ahead of them. We're not clear in the race. This is on a knife edge. And that's why I feel terribly nervous every single week. And that's why I'm not having any of this talk where people are going, it's yours to lose, it's yours to throw away. Arsenal are clear favourites because all they're trying to do is apply pressure on us. And um, all they're doing is setting up the narrative for if we do fail to be able to turn around and say, oh, look at Arsenal, uh, perennial bottle jobs, etc., etc. Arsenal always fall away at the end of the season, etc., etc. Mikel Arteta's inexperience, the team's inexperience, blah, 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 blah. That's what they're building up to. And um, we have to block that out at the moment. And we have to just focus on ourselves and focus on our games and, and focus on going out there and performing to the best level we possibly can. And hopefully that translates into the results that we need to go on and win the title. But... Um, It is now becoming clearer and clearer as the days go on and as that game at Anfield edges ever closer that William Saliba is very, very unlikely to make it. Um, That's been reported by a couple of journalists today. Um, They've gone as far as saying he's absolutely 100% ruled out. Uh, Hopefully, uh, he will be back soon. From what I understand, Arsenal are hopeful that he'll be back uh, in the not-too-distant future, but there's still been no real indication as to when exactly that might be. It is a back problem. Uh, We told you a few days ago, I think it was, that Chris Wheatley had reported to the contrary and said that it was a hamstring problem. But since then, uh, more and more of the reputable journalists have come forward and said, no, actually it is a back problem. And Mikel Arteta himself in the press conference after the Leeds United game confirmed it was a back problem too. Um, And he spoke about the need to be really cautious around this type of issue. Um, They are going to push William Saliba. They're going to try and get him back ASAP. But, um, you know, it's got to be done within reason as well. He's a very young player. A back issue uh, is not something that you want to carry around with you for the coming seasons and for the coming years. Uh, So I'm sure that they'll want to make sure that they deal with the problem right. But also you've got to balance that with the need to get him back in the side, given the position we find ourselves in. And listen, we've talked a lot about Rob Holding in the last few weeks. And and I thought he was decent against Leeds. And I thought he had a decent game against Crystal Palace as well. But I don't know that you get away with Rob Holding at Anfield. I mean, 
this is not the best Liverpool side. And, and I say that with caution because I know that they're capable of turning it on in a one-off game. And I do fear, um, you know, what we might face when we go there on Sunday. But yeah, I just think the sooner we can get William Saliba better, but it has to be a fit and ready William Saliba, then the more confident I'll feel about Arsenal's ability to go on and get the results that we need to go on and hopefully win this Premier League title. So that's the latest on William Saliba's fitness. Arsenal keeping very hush-hush. Arsenal not giving any further details, any further information. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because uh, ever since Mikel Arteta took over, that's the way it's been. And even more so this season where he's kept us guessing. He's um, not really given us the full picture when it comes to individuals and their problems. Um, never wanted to give return dates, any of that stuff. We saw it with Gabriel Jesus and then bang, you know, lo and behold, he was available and he was in the squad a lot earlier than I think a lot of us expected. So um, we can take some form of encouragement or maybe we can have some hope on the fact that Mikel Arteta does play it very cautious when it comes to these things. But I don't expect William Saliba to be available at Anfield on Sunday uh, based on what we're reading and based on, on what we're hearing as well. So that's a blow. There's no question about that. Um we're not a better side with Rob Holding in the heart of the defence than William Saliba. But if everybody else performs and if Rob Holding has a good day, there's reason to be optimistic or more optimistic about a trip to Anfield than in previous seasons. Because, of course, they're not firing on all cylinders. They go away to Chelsea tonight at the time of recording. You know, will that be a game in which they can pick up points and then they can, you know, be hopeful of getting into the top four and then that motivates them? going forward or, or will they lose at Stamford Bridge uh, against the Chelsea side without a permanent manager at the moment um, and will that kill off their top four chances in that case dent their confidence even further going into the game on Sunday there's still a lot of time to go and there's still a lot of variables here so I wouldn't get carried away uh, one way or the other um, we understand that Paul Tierney has been appointed uh, has been appointed as the referee of the game on Sunday Chris Kavanagh is his VAR um, in previous seasons, I never really used to make a big deal of who the referee was. And I never really even used to look into it. But nowadays I do, because I think the standard of refereeing right now is so questionable, across the board to be fair. But I can't help but factor in what a referee may or may not do in my analysis of a game ahead of it. Because it's become such a big thing, as I say in the Premier League, that how can you dismiss it? You know, it can be as important as injury news. It can be as important as um, tactics. It can be as important as all of those things because we've seen it time and time again. We've seen poor refereeing and poor officiating standards dictate the outcomes of football matches. So I looked into Paul Tierney's uh, record uh, when sort of covering Arsenal matches. We played 15 Premier League games with Paul Tierney in charge. We've won just six of them. We've lost six of them and we've drawn three. He's given us 31 yellow cards in those 15 games and one red card um okay the cards when it comes to yellow cards it's about two a game it's not anything that that jumps out at me one red card across 15 games isn't anything that really jumps out at me what does jump out at me though is the fact that we've only won six games of the 15 that he's been in charge now you could argue that arsenal's consistently level uh, consistency level i beg your pardon has improved so much this season that that might not be something we need to worry about. And, you know, yeah, it's probably not because of Paul Tierney that we only won six of those 15 games. I acknowledge that and accept that. But um, it is interesting to know who's going to be in charge because what we need going to Anfield is a strong referee. We need a referee who isn't going to buckle under the pressure of the Anfield crowd, who isn't going to be um, impacted by the atmosphere or by the occasion. We know that we've seen our players go there in the past and freeze. And, and that can happen to officials as well. Paul Tini's an experienced referee, at least, and I'm hoping that that will, um, that will help us a little bit um, in our quest to go there and, and, and come away with all three points, of course. Um, we talked about William Saliba's fitness. I'll quickly bring you up to speed on what's going on with his contract uh, because we've heard positive noises over the last few months. You know, he's come into Arsenal this season uh, from the dark, having been out on loan a few times. And he's really, really impressed. And he's taken like a duck to water. And if you listen to all of William Saliba's interviews and, and listen to all the things he's sort of discussed when faced by the media, he's always been really, really positive about his time at Arsenal now and how much he's enjoying it and how much he's um, 
enjoying being coached by Mikel Arteta and enjoying this season as a whole. So that gives me obviously confidence in him um, uh, wanting to stay and, and in his sort of desire uh, to commit to this club. But obviously, because of his contract situation and because of everything that's gone on before this season, William Saliba is in a position of power. We've got to be honest about that. You know, there was a time where we didn't know if he was even going to return to Arsenal. We didn't even know if he was going to play a game for Arsenal. And now we look at him as one of our most valuable assets. That's great for William Saliba because there will be clubs all across the continent looking at him now. But at the same time... Um, you know, what it does to Arsenal is put them in a position of, well, we've underappreciated you in the past. We will probably feel internally like giving him those loan moves and sending him away was the right decision because of the player that he's developed into. But at the time, William Saliba didn't feel like that. At the time, he felt disengaged, disenfranchised, disconnected even with Arsenal Football Club and Mikel Arteta. So now he's come back and proved to everybody that you know, he is good enough and he, he is someone that we should be relying on and building around. He is in a position from which he can demand bigger wages, bigger bonuses um, and, uh, you know, much better terms. And I think that's kind of probably why we haven't heard anything about this up until now. I think that William Saliba probably does want to stay, but also acknowledges and understands the position that he's in, or at least his representatives do when it comes to negotiations. And often these things can take an age. You know, I think this is something that will probably be wrapped up by the end of the season and it's something we'll probably hear about at the end of the campaign. Um, you know, I think there's a there's an element as well of Arsenal wanting to maybe hold fire on some of these announcements with regards to contracts. The official announcements, I'm talking about Saka's, um, Saliba's potentially as well, in that, you know, if Arsenal do narrowly miss out on the Premier League title, you know, yes, people will be disappointed and gutted at the time and, and people will find that a really bitter pill to swallow. But what I also know is that at the end of that, when um, when sort of the dust settles a little bit, as I keep saying, we'll all look back on it and go, well, this was a really good season. And this is only the beginning for this really young and exciting team and, and, and a team that we're all looking forward to watching develop further and grow further as the years go by. And so if there is a bit of disappointment at the end of the season, I think you can go some way in helping the fans get over it if you then go, well, look, we missed out, uh, but the future's bright here. Bang, we've signed Bukayo Saka down to a new contract. Bang, we've signed William Saliba down to a new contract as well. So I think there will be an element of that um, in Arsenal's thinking. I think they will want to uh, release the news around a lot of these players hopefully in one go um, or, or maybe in one go and, and potentially at a time where the crowd and the fan base after what's been a really difficult uh, season for us emotionally in a good way but it's still been difficult let's let's make no mistake about that um, I think they'll want to use that to kind of relift the mood if indeed uh, things don't go uh, as we planned so talks are still ongoing between William Saliba and Arsenal as far as we're aware no official announcement expected imminently um, but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been progress made. Often these things are kept hush-hush until all parties are ready uh, to make that announcement. Just a quick reminder as well to our loyal listeners and viewers. Uh, this podcast at the moment is brought to you in partnership with the good people over at NordVPN, named one of Time's 2022's best invention. VPN is a virtual private network which allows you to log in via a virtual private network and dictate from which location you are logging in virtually. And it's a fantastic tool for a number of reasons, which I'll get into in a moment. It costs the price of a cup of coffee per month. That is it. And I'm sure you'll agree that the benefits more than justify the cost. You can protect your data whilst traveling and using public Wi-Fi. Uh, NordVPN protects you wherever you are in the world. This is the one that will really grab you. You can watch sporting events, TV shows and films that aren't available in your region. How? By setting your virtual location as somewhere else. For example, one of the things that I've done over the years is log in via a, a virtual private network, set myself as being located in the US um, and I'm able to watch the US inventory on Netflix. Um, I'm of a Greek background and I often like to watch Greek television, especially around uh, the sort of uh, big celebrations, Easter, Christmas, etc., where there's lots of fantastic shows on and, and things that I enjoy. 
And what do I do? I set my VPN to Greece or to Cyprus so that I can access those websites and watch those TV channels on a free stream as I would be able to if I was based in those countries. But I can't do that from the UK without a VPN because I am geo blocked. The same when you travel abroad. If you are based in the UK and you go abroad and you want to log into your Virgin Go or your Sky Media or your BT Sport, you won't be able to do that based on the location that you're in but with a vpn you'll be able to set your location to the uk and you'll be able to bypass all those issues and watch stream listen to do whatever it is that you want on top of that you could purchase flights subscriptions and more at cheaper prices by logging on from another location the virtual private network allows you to set your location and that can be massively beneficial when looking to purchase things you can grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash Chronicles AFC to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. If you don't enjoy the service, if you don't find it of any use, you can, of course, cancel and get your money back within the 30 days. But we are giving you the opportunity to get a huge discount. Uh, by signing up via our promo code, you'll be supporting the podcast, but you'll also be benefiting from a, a really significant discount and four months free on what is a fantastic product. So do check it out. OK, uh, let's move on. Let's talk Rafael Leal. Um, he's a player that has been linked with Arsenal quite a bit in recent seasons, um, in recent months, I would say, maybe over the last year, ever since he kind of burst onto the scene in Italy and, and started making a real impression. He was key in Milan's charge to the Scudetto last season. Uh, Milan aren't going to win the Scudetto by any stretch of the imagination this season, you'd think. Uh, but the 23-year-old uh, has got 10 goals and 7 assists in 26 Serie A appearances so far this season. So he's continuing to perform. And if you caught the Napoli-Milan game at the weekend, you'd have been very, very impressed by Rafael Leal's performance. His current deal with Milan expires in June 2024 so by the time we get to this June he'll only have a year left and so there is an urgency on Milan's part to tie him down and to secure him into a longer term deal so that they can in the event they decide to sell him uh, get a good chunk of money for him and, and be able to or be in a position to be able to demand uh, a good transfer fee now, lots of talk about the, the contract talk stalling. Uh, there are reports coming out of Italy that that is the case as well. And I think a lot of people are putting two and two together and coming up with eight because I don't think that Arsenal are in the hunt for Rafael Leal. I think based on what Rafael Leal is probably going to cost, I think Arsenal will be deterred by that. And I also don't think that Milan will allow him to run this contract down. I think Milan will meet his demands um, at some point, obviously, there's going to be a bit of back and forth and there's going to be discussions and negotiations ongoing. But I think Milan will do whatever they can to try and secure him to a longer term deal with perhaps a release clause, for example, that protects them against losing the player for cheap, but also um, allows the player to move on if somebody comes in and pays what Milan and, and maybe what the player feels uh, he is worth as well. Um, so that's my view on this. I, I don't really buy into the Arsenal interest too much. I don't think it is a it is a goer for Arsenal. I think um, you know the the problem with Italian football nowadays is as as much as it's improved and it has. You only need to look at the Champions League where you've got three teams um, in the last eight, which is fantastic. Uh, you know that tells you that you know things are progressing. You look at the Europa League and you've got Juventus and. And, and, you know, Roma have had a good season in Europe, a decent season in Europe as well. So when you look at all of those things, it's clear that Italian football is moving in the right direction again. But the problem is that it just doesn't have the financial power that the Premier League does. In fact, there is no league in the world that has the financial power that the Premier League does. And so clubs will inevitably get to this point with their players. And you probably see the same with Victor Osiman at Napoli eventually, where Yes, they're, they're winning things and, and they're performing well and they're the, the talk of the town in Italy, which culturally is, a, is an amazing place when it comes to football. But there will come a point where they'll look at the Premier League and they'll go, I'm earning a fraction of what I could earn over there. And so it's inevitable that Milan and Napoli and all the other big Italian clubs, as they breed these talents and develop them and get them to a certain point, they're going to face a, a, a dilemma when it comes to renewing contracts, they're going to face a problem 
and they're going to have to put things in those contracts that at least make the player feel that if they really want that move away and a club really does want them, that can happen without the club digging their heels in and preventing it or, or slamming the door completely. So I think um, I think the state of Italian football um, and the disparity between the Serie A and the Premier League is is going to mean that clubs have opportunities to get talents like uh, Rafael Leao. I'd imagine that Kvitsa Kvaratskhelia is another one that in the coming years will probably move on for big money. But I just don't see Arsenal as being the uh, the next club for Rafael Leao. I'm sorry, uh, that might be something that disappoints people. But th- think about it like this, right? Rafael Leao's best position is from the left Arsenal have Martinelli, Arsenal have Trossard, Arsenal have Emile Smith-Rowe who can operate from that flank. You know, you look at some of the players coming through in the youth team. I I just don't see it. I don't see Arsenal going and spending big on that position. If they're going to bring in another forward, I think it's more likely it will be a right-sided player or a central player, um, in my personal opinion. But yeah, we'll see. Um, I've read the story. I keep seeing the links popping up. I just don't buy it at this moment in time. Uh, Let's talk briefly about Harry Kane's antics last night. Uh, The England captain uh, was involved in a collision with uh, Abdullah Decore, which saw the Everton man, (coughs) I beg your pardon, which saw the Everton man sent off. Listen, I'm not defending Decore, okay? Let me be clear on this before we get into this topic. Decore cannot raise his hands to an opponent like that. You you cannot put your hands in someone's face uh, in the way that Abdullah Decore did and think that that's going to go unpunished. Uh, it was absolutely the right decision to send him off for his actions. But Harry Kane has committed at least two fouls in the build-up uh, to that situation. And then when uh, caught by Decore in the face, and I've seen this still image going around of sort of Harry Kane like with with his face there and then Decore, what looks like he's kind of clawed him in the face and I I don't think it was that deep. I think the still makes it look a lot worse than it was. Regardless, it's a sending off. But Harry Kane, the way he went down and stayed on the ground for a good few minutes in a desperate attempt to get Decore sent off, um, I think is... I, I, I think it's disgusting, to be honest. And I think that had it been a foreign player, and I genuinely believe this, had that been a Spanish player, an Italian player, a French player, uh, that stayed down on the ground like that and, and made such a meal out of what was really not that big a deal, I think we'd all be talking about it today and we'd be saying, look at that, what a disgrace. And, you know, look, you could argue that players from anywhere would, would do something of that nature in a competitive environment to try and get their opponents sent off. And that's fine. All I want is the same energy to be applied when we're talking about Harry Kane and his gamesmanship as he's applied when we're talking about some of the foreign imports as well. That's my only issue with it. Uh, I did want to bring that up and I've seen a few pundits come out and and sort of criticise Harry Kane's reaction and I think that's right and I don't think we should be afraid uh, to be honest about his reaction because he's the England captain. We've seen over the years England captains get preferential treatment in a lot of ways. Um, and I just don't want to see that applied again when it comes to yesterday because although the core eight deserved to be sent off, I thought Harry Kane's reaction was was embarrassing, if I'm being honest with you. Um, a couple of other bits to just quickly touch on. Uh, Arsenal and Chelsea, according to Football Insider, are interested in Everton's 21-year-old Belgian midfielder Amadou Onana, who is valued at £70 million. I look at Amadou Onana and I see a really... Uh, physical player, someone that I think has a lot of the attributes required to go on and become a real dominating, competitive central midfielder. But I don't think he's the finished article yet. I think technically he's still a little bit raw and I think there would need to be a lot of work done to get him up to the level, for example, of a Thomas Partey. But in one of the eight positions as someone that will be up and down box to box, if he can work on his impact in the attacking third and... um, and, you know, he can be, I think, a little bit more streetwise in terms of his positioning. And I think he's a he'd be a good buy at £70 million, pounds, though. Nah, that's too much. Um, I thought <coughs> the figures being discussed for Moises Caicedo were too much, and they were. Um, and, and so I understand why Arsenal didn't want to go any further. But if you weren't going to pay that for Caicedo, I don't see how you can pay that for Amadou and Anna at this point. And also, if Everton do get relegated, obviously there's a long way to go. If they did, they wouldn't be in a position to demand £70 million for Amadou and Anna either. 
Um, another rumour, transfer rumour, that just won't go away. Another link that has been there for what feels like forever. According to Team Talk, Arsenal have held talks with Belgian midfielder Yuri Tielemans, whose contract at Leicester runs out this summer. Now, we know that Yuri Tielemans hasn't made his mind up yet as to where he's going to go. We did sort of discuss the idea back in the January transfer window that Arsenal may well be waiting until the end of the season to try and nab Yuri Tielemans on a free. I think Tielemans as an eight would be an excellent fit for Arsenal. I really, really do. And speaking of Re Everton and relegation trouble, well, Leicester find themselves in a similar position. So there's a good chance that Leicester will have to let Yuri... Uh, sorry, there's a good chance that Leicester, having gone down, will be in no position to convince, I should say, Yuri Tielemans to sign a new deal. They haven't managed it up until now. Maybe because on his side there is a fear that this is coming. Um, but what it will do if Leicester go down um, is mean that I think there'll be even more attention on Yuri Tielemans, who's a free transfer uh, at the end of the season because of the fact that, you know, naturally what clubs tend to do is look at those that went down and think, right, what can we take? Uh, it's a bit like looting, isn't it? You know, the, the, there's chaos. So you go in and you grab what you can and you get out of there. And, and that will be the case with Yuri Tielemans regardless. But I think if ever if Leicester, I beg your pardon, do go down, I think there'll be more spotlight on where a lot of their players end up and that might lead to greater competition around Yuri Tielemans. I'd like to think if Arsenal want him that contract talks have already been held or at least unofficial conversations have gone on in the background. Uh, but I guess in the summer we're going to find out if all the Tielemans to Arsenal stuff um, and the interest that Arsenal are rumoured to have in Yuri Tielemans is actually genuine. If they don't pull the trigger and do it this summer, then maybe it was all a load of nonsense. But we'll uh, we'll find out, I'm sure, um, as the uh, the summer months come to pass. Uh, thank you all so, so much, as always, for tuning in. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for uh, bearing with us. Thanks for uh, supporting the podcast, as always. Don't forget to leave a like if you're watching us on YouTube. And subscribe to the channel if you're new. Don't forget to leave us a review if you're listening on audio. Uh, to let you know, tomorrow's episode, so Wednesday's episode, it will be a mailbag episode. So if you've got any questions that you want to get in, I will be putting a couple of social media posts up uh, to encourage people to ask away. But if you've got any uh, that you uh, can think of right now or a little bit later on, pop into the, the comments section of this episode and uh, let me know uh, what those questions are. Alternatively, if you're listening on audio, you can tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC with your questions, and I'll do my best to get through as many of those as I possibly can on tomorrow's episode of the podcast. Have a great evening. Uh, have a great day. The sun is shining here in London. I hope it is wherever you guys are too, and I will see you all soon. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>